Hi, it's Kate Crowley. I just wanted to update you on some of the research um, on appropriate disability evaluations. Um, so what does the federal law say? All students are entitled to evalu an evaluation with evaluation materials that are free from cultural and racial biases. And these evaluation materials have to be able to distinguish a disability from lack of adequate instruction in reading, lack of adequate instruction in math, and from limited English proficiency. Not a single assessment, standardized assessment can do that. It's a challenge. New York State says New York State L's are disproportionately identified as students with disabilities. So the overall classification rate is 14%. With L's, it's closer to 19%. So it's about uh, 20, about a 30% overall referral. Um, L's are significantly over-identified, speech and language impaired, langu um, learning disabled, and emotionally disturbed. Um, speech and language impairment is basically kindergarten through fourth grade. That's where it happens. Why can't score-based evaluations work to identify? Are they magic? We only wish they were. Um, we have an enormous amount of research showing that the use of standardized scores will result in every bilingual or minority student or student from a lower SES background who's been referred for an evaluation, meaning they're having some trouble in the school, virtually every single one of them will be identified as having a disability. Our job as evaluators, so we need, the reason we need training, we need a master's, is to make that differential di diagnosis. Is the disorder a difference or an academic gap? Betts et al. in 2013 wanted to see how people choose the evaluation materials that they use. And they found that most SLPs use the omnibus language test, the SELF, the PLS, the GOLD, the DEL, and single word vocabulary test, the PPBT, the expressive one word, the receptive one word. And publication date was the only test characteristic correlated with frequency of use. So it didn't matter the validity, reliability. If the Crowley 4, 4th edition came out uh, with a Crowley 5th edition, well, whenever that came out, publication date was why I chose that test. Um, the use of long-standing tests saves time because then you, when the new one comes out, you just go buy it. Not many changes usually. Very easy to give. But they're not based on cutting research anymore. The PPBT, we used to give it because, I mean, 50 years ago, way before I was practicing. Why? Because that 50 years ago was considered a really good way of vocabulary test, a labeling vocabulary test. Uh, to to label, um, to identify language disorder. And the kind of research that was used 40 years ago and 30 years ago for the expressive one word, the self, the PLS, was cutting edge back then. It is no longer. But we still use it because you just buy the next test. Any evaluator who uses a test to identify a disability without examining its psychometric integrity is doing a disservice to the children and students. If you look at the Betts article, you'll say the self and one or two other tests meets the advanced and plant standard, but that's based on what they say in their manual. And yes, it does, but you have to look deeper, which is exactly what the Betts article says. What is the reference standard for the sensitivity and specificity? Is it appropriate? What are the other psychometric foundations of this test to, to, to make it valid or to establish reliability? That you have to get into. In April 2018, a new article came out, which should have basically ended your use of the self for Spanish. Um, it's, uh, they found that in every one in three typically developing Latino kid from a lower SES, who were in all English school, meaning getting ESL instead of, or ENL, whatever you use where you are, um, instead of a bilingual class, um, they, uh, one in three, meaning 33% disproportionate referral of these kids for special education, meaning it misidentified 33% of these typically developing kids as having a disorder, having a language disorder. So you really shouldn't be using this test at all since April 2018. If you have a disproportionate referral of minority kids for special education or bilingual kids, and you're using the self for Spanish, it's a very easy direct connection. What about scoring modifications? So I'm not sure many of you use this, but in the self for it was introduced also in the self five, where they gave a list of um, ways of scoring if the children spoke one of the language variety other than standard American English, because the self is primarily an assessment of morphology of standard American English and vocabulary. So um, Hendricks and Adolph looked at, um, looked at how kids who spoke, they looked at African American English, but the back of the self has Appalachian, Hispanized English, Chinese influenced English, or maybe one or two others, um, and African American English. So they gave, um, they gave these kids this test, and then they looked at the results. And what they found was if they just gave the self 
four and scored it. Um, the tip, many typically developing kids would be misidentified as having a language disorder. Makes sense. They're being scored as having a uh, problem when they actually have acquired the language variety they've been exposed to. And if you use the dialect scoring modifications, meaning if the kid doesn't use a possessive apostrophe S for John's book, John book, in many language varieties of English, um, that is perfectly acceptable. But if they didn't use that, they were given a correct score. And so if you use the dialect scoring modification, the kids with language disorders were not accurately identified. So if you don't use them, uh, the kids who are typically developing are going to be misidentified as having a language disorder. If you do use the dialect scoring modifications, kids who have a language disorder are not going to be identified. So don't use them. Don't use the self with these kids. Don't use the scoring modifications. Arias and Freiburg in 2017 uh, did a nationwide survey to figure out what SLPs were doing. This is a, another one was done in 2007. And they found that contrary to 20 years of research, most SLPs are using the self, the PLS, the TOLD, the vowels, the TELD, and vocabulary tests, these omnibus language tests and the omnibus vocabulary tests, like the express and receptive one with picture vocabulary tests, and the PPVT. After 20 years of research, and they're still being taught it in many universities in their master's program today. Aris and Freiburg did notice a slight increase in the use of language samples. How should we do bilingual evaluations based on 20 years of research? Language sampling, non-word repetition tests, and dynamic assessment. Pavelko Owens, Ireland, and Haas Vaughan looked at the use of language samples by school-based SLPs, and they found that most of them did not use language samples. In their work, they said it took too much time. And most of them, what they did was conversational speech. The problem with that is it did, we have research showing it doesn't stress the linguistic system enough. So it's easy to have conversational speech and not have to use complex sentences and complex syntax. That's why it's better to use expository um, elicitation tasks or narrative tasks up to about 10 or 11 years old. Conceptual scoring and vocabulary assessment. So Ananya, Peña, and Bador in 2018 looked at conceptual scoring. And basically conceptual scoring is you give the kid a vocabulary test and then you let that, if they, whatever they get wrong, you let them do it in Spanish or whatever. It's, it's an English test, you let them do it in Spanish. It's a Spanish test, you let the words they got wrong, let them do it in English. There's variations above that. And what they found was um, the... None of the methods achieved a minimum standard of 80% accuracy and sensitivity and specificity. Um, even using the most accurate cutoff scores uh, as provided by the tests themselves, the classification accuracy was below 80% throughout all scoring methods and sensitivity and specificity ranged from 56% to 79%, 56% flip a coin, save your money on the test. And so SLP should not use vocabulary tests to identify language impairment and conceptual scoring does not make up for these limitations. And the last article that we're going to look at is the Hoffman Ireland Halls Mill and Flynn from 2013, which looked at um, oh, whether SLPs are looking at uh, evidence-based practice by looking at the research. They looked at 2,762 SLPs in the schools. Most of them had master, 93% had master's degrees, 85% were had their ASHA C's. And the majority researched only zero to two evidence-based questions a year, meaning I have something that goes on in this assessment or this uh, intervention, this therapy. How can I, you know, what does the research tell me about that? And, and they read only zero to four ASHA journal articles a year. So you can see why there's such a wide gap between the research and the clinical practice. Um, of course, some the research, there's so much research out there that is not applicable to the clinical practice, and ASHA has moved much stronger towards providing clinical practice, research that supports the clinical practice. So hopefully we're moving in the right direction. Thank you so much. I hope this was helpful to you, and uh, more research, better evaluations.